understand uh, at least for now just because that's what I do. Um, so first of all, uh, welcome to all of you. I know we still have some people coming in. Um, can I just say I am really impressed that any of you are still awake at this point? Yes, let's give yourselves give yourselves a hand. Um, yes, uh, including them. Uh, I know that I am at the point where I am completely wiped out. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about OpenStack and the Internet of Things uh, because we it's just something that we really can't ignore. I'm sure if uh, if if IoT is your thing, you've probably been to other sessions um, this week, and uh, it's yeah, <laughs> we got we got to pay attention. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce my uh, my esteemed panelists here, um, who are not sitting in the order in which they are on this slide. So we'll just kind of work our way down. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and. Uh, Tell us who they are and what they do and, and for whom. Uh, and I'm Nick Drake, by the way. Hi, I'm Nikki Acosta with Cisco, also a co-host of OS Pod and OpenStack Focus Podcast. And I am an OpenStack evangelist at Cisco. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alexander Adamov uh, from Arantes. Uh, I'm VP of Research, and I've been working for a while in antivirus industry. Hi, I'm XP Chen. I'm from uh, IBM, and I'm responsible for IBM Watson IoT engineering. Are we on with that mic? I'm Kumutini Ratnasingam. I work for Juniper Networks, SaaS software engineer. I am on the product side, uh, technical marketing side, and I'm also an active member in OpenStack community. Hi, my name is Sean Collins. I'm mostly working in the Neutron QA project within OpenStack, but I also do a lot of work with uh, initiatives like the OpenStack Guide, which is the architecture guide to OpenStack Framework. <laughs> Lots of guides. Lots of guides. We, we all know how many guides OpenStack needs, so we try and write as many of them as we can. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So as you can see here, we're going to talk about uh, OpenStack and the Internet of Things and, you know, how they relate together and it, it whether we're just piggybacking on uh, on a hot term, spoiler alert, no, we're not. Um, so we're going to talk about where we are and where we're going and, you know, why it's important. And uh, before, you know, before we worry about, uh, you know, Skynet coming and Terminator, you know, just destroying all of us, uh, we have some more basic concerns. Um, and uh, then we'll look at, you know, okay, so that's great. What do we already have? And what does the OpenStack community need to be thinking about and putting together in order for us to uh, be able to make this uh, really a, a reality? So uh, this here is a survey that I took off the Internet. Um, I'm not really going to go through all this data. My whole point of this data is, boy, there's a lot of people talking about this. Uh, and and there's uh, really, really a good reason. So I'm, I'm going to hand off to uh, to our panelists here to talk about kind of where we are now and, and why this is all important. And I uh, cheated and wrote down my stats because I'm not smart enough to remember them. I'm going to go ahead and blame the party the other night as well as all the barbecue I've consumed this week. Uh, so in 2008, there were already more things connected to the Internet than people, which is crazy more things connected to the internet than people. Uh, by 2019, companies are going to ship 1.9 billion connected home devices. Uh, and you're looking at you know, uh, just a tremendous market opportunity. Uh, by 2025, the global worth of IoT technology could be as much as $6.2 trillion. So if you hear big companies hopping on the IoT bandwagon, uh, this is why. It's a tremendous market opportunity. And of course, all of these things need infrastructure to run on. And uh, OpenStack, obviously, is a, a key technology in terms of cloud computing, and one that a lot of companies are looking at to power this sort of wave of digitization. Yeah, just to add what uh, Nikki just shared, you said there is uh, more devices connected than human being. Exactly, we have 10 billion devices connected to internet today. 
and uh, we expect that number go up to 30 billion by 2020. So really, Internet of Things is just a digitalize the physical world we are in. Wow. Uh, I, in my opinion, I think uh, in about 20, 30 years from now, we are going to look back and look at our lives and say we were living inefficient life. IoT and uh, OpenStack are going to bring a lot of efficiency to our lives and to our business models. A lot of, uh, from the data, the massive amount of data, we extract valuable information from that. Uh, we are the businesses and uh, even our uh, household lives. We are going to make a smart decision and make our life more efficient. That's why we need IoT. And um, for instance, in uh, Juniper Networks, we are uh, co-innovating with our customers and partners to build the right infrastructure to scale and to secure, automate uh, the network with our partners and to, so that we can provide you know, high performance scalable networks uh, which is agile and also we have um, uh, advanced powerful uh, analytics technologies and tools that we are partnering with our, uh, with our customers and our partners so that uh, our partners and customers can take full advantage of uh, IoT or what is possible with IoT. Excellent, thank you. Um, did we have, uh, do we have any more comments on this? Okay, so let me just kind of hop back up here. Uh, have I mentioned that this is the fourth day of the summit and I'm exhausted and didn't plug in my computer? So, uh, yeah, so if you can see here, this is a, uh, this is a shot that actually comes from Cisco. Um, these are all the different, this is an example of the sort of different systems that have to be handled with, uh, in, a, in a world where everything is, you know, internetified. Thank you very much. So, uh, let's talk about kind of some of these uh, things that we should be worried about. Uh, I think the major concern is security. Uh, uh, we've heard a lot of uh, posts and uh, notifications in media when ethical hackers, white hat guys, they uh, investigated the security of Internet of Things. They hacked uh, uh, smart city, smart home, uh, medical devices. Uh, recently, uh, my colleague in past in, uh, from Kaspersky Lab, uh, he posted a research how he hacked a hospital. So he managed to get access to a, a magnetic resonance imaging device, MRI, and uh, he penetrated through the local Wi-Fi network and uh, was able to access the storage where these you know, funny pictures with brain and bones are stored. So that, that showed like uh, Internet of Things devices and the infrastructure are uh, exposed to uh, the threats, to the all known threats like spoofing, tampering, uh, denial of service, elevation of privileges, repudiation. Let me just ask a question. So, uh, so does that mean if I have my thermostat on on the internet, that I should be worried about the rest of my stuff? Yeah, I should be worried that uh, you can die of, swe of sweating <laughs> 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 or freeze. Yes. I I agree with uh, Alex. Security is definitely what we see uh, top or number one uh, concerns our client have. So it is very important to have the basic security building in Internet of Things like authentication, authorization, access control. But I want to push that a little bit further. No matter how good your system is, there's still risks to be attacked. Let's just face it. So it is extremely important to have risk management. That means be able to detect the anomalies and the send alert for your clients, give them the time to respond before damage is done. Um, so in my opinion, I think uh, the data that we collect, um, who owns the data? Let's say we have uh, businesses and uh, we collect the data. It goes to the data collection center to get analyzed and to extract valuable data information from that. 
but it has to pass uh, different points, so it opens up for hackers to hack in and uh, take the information. So um, the, the main uh, objective here is there could be, like if it's a household um, uh, IoT devices, we may even see small mini data centers, just like the way we have the solar panels on our roofs, we may, even have, we may even install small data centers to analyze our data. But when it comes to businesses, the security, obviously, who owns the data, whom are we sending the information to, who is going to get handled of the data. So uh, in Juniper, we are coming up with a lot of innovative technologies and innovative um, uh, algorithms to uh, position well uh, ourselves so that we can help our customers to, uh, in, uh, to take full advantage of IoT. Excellent. So uh, let's talk for a minute here. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, Alex, tell us what is a tax service and why is this relevant? Uh, <coughs> the tax service includes actually two parts. The first part is actually endpoint devices, so like uh, sensors, uh, this uh, medical devices, so on. And the second uh, uh, area is uh, cloud infrastructure where the data are collected and uh, processed. So uh, from my, from my um, standpoint, I think uh, the major uh, concern in security should, should be addressed to uh, cloud infrastructure. And uh, uh, today uh, we had a talk from HP Architects and they suggested uh, architecture, uh, security architecture that provides uh, uh, protection of uh, IoT infrastructure, but mostly uh, pointing to uh, cloud infrastructure. So they, they suggested using uh, VNF, virtual net, uh, network function, to introduce uh, intrusion prevention system, intrusion detection system, antiviruses in the cloud. So cloud infrastructure for IoT needs the same uh, uh, the same protection as uh, any other kind of information system. So probably a little bit more. Even more. And and uh, the interesting thing that um, I ju just talked to uh, one manager, technical manager of IoT company, and uh, he showed the interface, management interface, how they can access the database of all customers. They actually can control all uh, IoT devices uh, that uh, they they sell and they they uh, support, and uh, uh, usually uh, chipsets, <laughs> chipsets uh, of Internet uh, of Things devices they contain some hard-coded SSH key. So uh, this is done uh, to provide ability for uh, for manufacturer for vendor to uh, support to provide uh, services to the customers. If something goes wrong, so they can connect to a device through, for example, uh, IoT router, and to check uh, what, what is going wrong. And this is, this is the major, uh, major concern, uh, security concern, because once you hack this uh, management interface, once you get access to this cloud infrastructure, you can uh, get access to all uh, IoT devices, and you can, uh, pro uh, you can do cyber espionage, you can uh, destroy, you can even kill people. Okay, there's. Um, it's it's, it's I, pessimistic. I, I wasn't I wasn't expecting that. I don't I don't know if anybody else here was expecting that. I I was not. So so uh, <laughs> don't don't be nervous. Um, <laughs> um, you just told me my thermostat can kill me. What do you mean? Don't be nervous. No no no. Th th <laughs> this is what a hacker may do, right? <laughs> but um, a robust. Uh, I would say commercial IoT platform have building device management that prevent this kind of uh, risk and a security attack. That's definitely- They should be having it, is exactly. what you're saying. This yeah. is a top focus. Right, right. Good. Okay, so um, other concerns. Uh, Sean or Nikki, do you wanna talk about other concerns that we should have? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to things like self-driving cars, you know, airplanes, things, <laughs> transportation vehicles, you know, when you're, when it's literally a matter of, of life and death where a, a bad decision uh, can, can create havoc for yourself or those around you or your family, like this is definitely, you know, scary. I mean, I, uh, I bought a, a Honda recently, love my Hondas, and I got a newer model and it's connected now. And I know it's connected because I'm supposed to get like an oil change like every six to 8,000 miles or something crazy. But now when I'm getting close, as soon as that like early warning light comes in, 
Like literally that day I get an email saying, hey, you're due for an oil change. Here's a coupon. And I'm like, man, what, <laughs> what else do they know? <laughs> I mean, they probably know where I'm driving. They probably know. I've got like the, the nav in the dash. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting to think about the companies that have this data and what they could potentially do with it or how valuable that could become. You know, knowing where, where I go, where I shop, how long I'm there, like that's all interesting data uh, that the companies uh, need to protect and secure. Absolutely. So uh, setting aside the security piece for a second, let's just discuss the capacity part. Um, most of the world is still trying to adopt IPv6 and in order to talk to all of these devices in your customer's home, you know, past the customer premise equipment, you need to start thinking about designing your apps around the, the correct networking model for the 21st century, which is IPv6. The other thing you'll have to consider is the fact that you will have so many devices, you will need to do capacity planning within your data center and start to discuss the, not necessarily the, the density of so perhaps your hypervisors and the number of virtual machines that are running on each hypervisor, but also perhaps from the other side of the equation, determining how many inter IoT devices will be establishing sessions uh, with these virtual machines or whatever your control plane is. Um, so you'll almost be pressed up against two different types of concerns, which is the density of your hypervisor and then also the density of all the devices that are connected to that. Um, to ensure for disaster recovery purposes, um, the amount of bandwidth that you'll be consuming out of a single data center or even a single compute unit, that's those types of things. And then you'll also have to build your applications um, to also conserve the amount of data that is being transmitted among uh, very large and expensive paths. This is why he writes guides, because he thinks about the actual practical things. So yes, Thank good. You. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk about let's talk about kind of where we are right now. And we are going to save a bunch of time for questions, so don't worry about that. So um, Sean, tell us a little bit about where we are on IPv6, and then we'll kind of move on from there. Sure. So within OpenStack in the Neutron community, there was a team that was built from a diverse number of companies, which has prepared OpenStack to be IPv6 enabled. Um, that work was done a couple of years ago, so we find ourselves in a nice position here that as the interest from the application developers and the um, device manufacturers get ready for the IoT paradigm, we're in a good position where we've already done the majority of the legwork for that to then occur. Um, the orchestration piece as well within the OpenStack community and all the tools that we have floating around uh, to do application development such as the first app application guide. <laughs> I'm always on message. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm going to hand it off to somebody to discuss more of the big data piece. Uh, um, yeah, that's great. yeah, sure. So we talk about there are lots of uh, devices in the um, magnitude of uh, billions of devices. Think about all the data could come from those devices. They are both structured data, unstructured data, it's going to be huge amount of data lake. It's uh, one thing you might want to consider. Another thing, you may not want to push every single piece of uh, device data to the cloud. In some cases, the device is a low power device, cannot afford to do that from the uh, capacity perspective. In other cases, maybe in the shipyard, it's very poor internet access. You just cannot. So one thing to to keep in mind, to consider when we design all those uh, solutions, applications for Internet of Things is fully leverage the analytic power on the edge or gateway. So you don't have to and you don't want to push every single piece of data to the cloud. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, now let's talk about what we still need. Okay. Who wants to start that one off? So uh, I think like we uh, maintenance and upgrade um, upgradability that is very important even uh, uh, in OpenStack or in any apps because there is going to be 50 billion devices 2020 and uh, the the uh, also the success of uh, IoT depends on security and how fast it can uh, function so. 
the maintenance cycles and upgradability is going to be the key for that usability point of view. Excellent. Uh, so the other thing to discuss, as the other panelists uh, said, is that there are some applications where it's not desirable to throw everything back up into the cloud or to you know your main expensive data center. Uh, with the ability to, for IoT devices to communicate to each other with no network address translation or middle boxes that create uh, reachability problems, there is m more of an ability for these devices to talk amongst, amongst each other. So think of it like the way the airplane that we all flew, flew in here, there are networking equipment on those planes for different pieces to talk to each other. Um, so that sort of paradigm of multiple devices talking in concert with each other over the network will probably find its way over into the consumer type of devices that are now being built and designed. Another thing I see we still need is currently Internet of Things focus a lot on the uh, device connectivity, device management, get data uh, into the edge device or into the cloud. Really, the reason we want to do this is once we have all the data, have device talk to each other, we want to analyze the data to draw some insight. So this is the next thing I see we are going. It's a focus on the analytic power of this. Now I say IBM Watson provide some uh, um, analytic power that we build in into the Internet of Things like natural language processing, predictive analytics, cognitive analytics, uh, et cetera. That's what we see we will go next that can really benefit, draw the value out of the data. I have to say that the, the idea of uh, cognitive computing and you know where it can take all this data uh, that we're getting is, well, it's exciting to me. I don't know about anybody else, but I find it exciting. Did you have uh, something to say? Yeah, I just uh, like to point, uh, just say a few words about scalability. Uh, if we have like uh, such a big uh, number of uh, IT devices and this number is growing and reaching like billions, so we need to think about scalable cloud ar uh, architecture as well and uh, to think about how we can apply security services inside of the cloud. Uh, on, on another note, I think uh, we're, we're at a point now, and those of you who've been involved in OpenStack for a while are probably well aware, but there's a massive talent gap right now. Just for OpenStack knowledge and expertise, you know, people are starting to experiment with OpenStack, enterprises are rolling it out, they're running it in labs, they're realizing it's a lot of work. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, billions and billions of devices that are coming online. Uh, and even though that, you know, it may seem a, a simple to the consumer, there, there's still a a huge level of knowledge and expertise that is needed to be able to build and operate these underlying platforms that are going to power all of these devices in the future. And so I think it's it's time now to start enabling, not only our, for ourselves to start learning about this stuff, uh, but just doing research for this panel, I was like, man, I need to get get with it. There's a lot I don't know about this stuff, but uh, I think it's we're in a really good place as OpenStack to be able to, being a newer technology, I think we have the opportunity to start attacking this now. Uh, but I think it's going to be a while before there's going to be enough people that can uh, that can run and operate these massively scalable platforms that could be a matter of life or death. Again, with the life or death. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, so uh, regarding the analytics piece, um, we also in Juniper, we realize and we have uh, already have tools to do uh, predictive analysis and uh, powerful analytics uh, and big data analysis. Uh, so we have actually uh, proved ourselves in the market that uh, we are one of the leaders in the analytics uh, po uh, part and we are going to be well positioned to help our customers to enable IoT a success. Okay. So um, before we go into Q&A, did anybody have any final words they wanted to say? I assume you just had your final words, so did anybody else want to go ahead? Uh, okay, uh, my final word is that uh, uh, we define the attack service like endpoint devices and uh, cloud infrastructure. Uh, uh, so far, uh, we've seen attacks to uh, endpoint devices only by ethical hackers because the value of uh, the attack is uh, quite high. 
I mean, you need to spend a lot of efforts, but uh, you know, the benefit of it is kind of quite low. I uh, I think it's just mostly driven by scientists, by researchers. Uh, but uh, information as assets uh, available in clouds are much more valuable, and that's why we need to think, uh, invest more money to security of uh, to secure cloud infrastructure. And I think uh, such technology like. Uh, uh, OpenStack, NFV, so this will enable to provide uh, scalable uh, uh, security services. Questions? Yeah. Anybody? Going once, going twice. Okay, questions. Anybody have any questions? There are mics here and here. A couple of takers, so let's give it a minute. So have you guys thought about what could be the business models for this? I mean, some of, some of them is very useful for anyone, like you know the traffic on the freeways and where the cars are. So that's obvious. But others, which is more personal, like your experience with in consumer doesn't want to participate or wants to participate, how the business model going to evolve on this? I think what we're starting to see, and, and it's interesting because I've, I've bought, um, I bought the Philip Hue light bulbs. And I was actually kind of surprised when I powered these things up and I realized that there was no subscription for it. I was like, wow, they're missing a huge opportunity because I would have paid you know, extra money to have all this stuff work better. Uh, but if you look at like Nest thermostats or uh, you, know, you buy it kind of one time and then you're kind of good. The Nest Cam is interesting because you buy the Nest Cam, they give you a free trial to uh, record your data for a period of 10 days. And at the end of the month, they say, hey, your subscription ran out. If you want us to keep showing you 10 days worth of history, you need to subscribe. Uh, and so I'm starting to see the subscription model, the Netflix model, kind of uh, infiltrating this, these new platforms, which is great because you know, a one-time purchase to run something you know, for possibly years, it's just I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, if you are creating these innovative technologies and you're constantly adding new features, that requires you know teams of people to keep it up and running and monitored and going and you know new features to be rolled out. And so I'm starting to see the subscription model. You know maybe the devices get cheaper in terms of the hardware, but you're going to pay in perpetuity. So I definitely see that shift. You know it's like the whole capex versus opex discussion for businesses. It's definitely starting to make its way into into at least consumer grade uh, Internet of Things devices. Yeah, I can give you another example that I can see industry solution built upon Internet of Things. For example, with the weather data and your current location data, we can, we can build a solution for uh, uh, insurance based on your location and the current weather condition, give you advice. Should you stay here or should you get to the next mall or coffee shop, park your car in the garage, you can avoid a hailstorm or things like that. If you take those advice, can lower your insurance premium. That's just an example, an industry solution. Excellent, thank you. Another one that I've seen, which is kind of interesting, is the farming industry. And you think about, you know, farming industry is kind of being maybe one that's not, you know, something you think of being sort of on the cutting edge of technology. But uh, even as early as, I think it was about four years ago, there was a, a big, I'll say, farming manufacturing equipment maker that we spoke to who was evaluating OpenStack. And the reason being is because they had these devices that were spread out all over the United States in really rural areas. And so they wanted to make sure that they knew, A, where these devices were, where they were being used, and B, they wanted to know the health of these devices. Because if these devices were starting to fail or requiring maintenance, it created a new sales opportunity, maintenance opportunities, opportunities to make more money. And so you think of farming, they've got you know, drones now that can fly over fields and take real-time uh, video and photographs. And they've got sensors in the soil to make sure that all the pH levels are right. Uh, they've got uh, lighting systems inside greenhouses that when there's natural light up, they'll turn those lights down. As that natural light starts to wane or if the weather is really bad, they'll actually turn on these lights uh, at a certain level to mimic the sun. So you think about you know, farming as you know, kind of an old school industry, but it's definitely one industry where we're starting to see a bunch of uh, solutions uh, for IoT going in. Let me just say something about farming. When your entire yearly uh, 
income is based on like what you get out of a three month period, it is important for you to make sure that everything goes the way that it should. So there you go. Just okay. one comment. We have this uh, solution in production in Europe today. <laughs> it's like shameless plug day. While you're at it, we, uh, Cisco acquired this company called Jasper, and they do cool stuff like that, too. What do you got, Marantis? <laughs> we got this panel. <laughs> we, we have an open stack that works. <laughs> Zing! I wanted to quickly touch upon the healthcare industry. We already have, uh, you know, my doctor devices kind of at home, checking our blood pressure and sugar and all that. In that industry, I see a tremendous growth in that uh, industry. And cities, lots of cities. Yes, smart, uh, smart cities, um, that, which which will save XP from having to plug IBM Smart Cities. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, let me just, uh, we're going to do your questions in like one second, but let me just tell you that when I was looking for cartoons for this, I hit, I found cartoons on like all of these, like your doctor just called, he said he's noticed that you had a second piece of pie. <laughs> or um, a guy was going up an escalator and there was very embarrassing ads pointed to, you know, Bob, you know, make sure you sleep more than six into four, 6.4 hours at night. Bob, take care of your rather embarrassing disease. And the caption was, still feeling about smug about uh, being an early adopter of those wearable devices? So, um, all right, go ahead. What's your question? Hi, um, my question actually touches a lot on what you were just talking about is, what about the ethical impl uh, implications? What about the ethical implications? Um, what if I want, or I don't want my car to be knowing where I am? What if I want to opt out? Um, can you guys talk about that a little bit? Build a cell phone jam. I don't think that uh, I don't think that uh, you know regulations are keeping up with privacy. Undoubtedly, I mean, ever since the Snowden thing, I think privacy has just become a huge thing. I think there's huge ethical impl uh, implications. You know, I had a friend who got an Amazon Echo, and he was uh, venting about how he uh, didn't like his job. And literally the next day, he got uh, an ad that said, "Hey, Amazon is now hiring," <laughs> which is <laughs> really strange. And he was like, "Man, is this is this connected? Like, I have." I have no idea. Even on Facebook, you know, you send private messages on Messenger with somebody, and then all of a sudden you're getting ads for whatever it is that you talked about. So I, I think there's huge, huge ethical impl implications. I mean, there was the, the, the famous uh, hack of I think it was like baby monitors that went out, and yeah. you know, people figured out you could drive by and basically pick up on this network and see what's going on and listen to what's going on in someone's home. I mean. You know, it's important to have that security implemented at, in the design process instead of coming back afterwards and doing that so you don't have like, you know, silly generic uh, IP addresses that are going uh, to your devices. But I think that's where, you know, companies like, you know, IBM and uh, Juniper and others are, are really focusing is making those platforms uh, ready to address security kind of upfront instead of waiting until something like that happens. So the question was, um, what if I just don't want to opt out completely and I don't want you know, my car to be internet connected? Uh, that, that was the question. So. Yeah, so yes, uh, I can say for the Watson IoT, we will allow some uh, configuration policy that can build in, give that flexibility. But I agree with you that this is a much bigger area. Keep your car healthy, your existing ride. <laughs> Forever. So I'm um, Japanese cars are pretty known for their reliability. So you can always just look for those Honda Civics and you know the stuff that are in the used market, or maybe just go down to a motorcycle. Or a bicycle. Bicycle. There you go. Well, until they start strapping stuff onto them. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, my question is a concern about the community concerns. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to come closer. We can't hear. Uh, my question is about the community concerns, the diversity. Uh, the, you may know that 10 years ago, the every person joined the Linux community, that so there are a couple of years of conflict of the misunderstanding of each other. IoT world, now, uh, we may uh, collaborate with every guy, with device guy, with a, cl a cloud guy with, uh, like us, how do you think about uh, uh, how to uh, make collaboration with embedded guy, with uh, cloud guy, cloud, cloud persons? 
uh, uh, the OpenStack community can uh, accept the embedded engineers, embedded communities? I'm gonna I'm gonna confess here uh, something that most of you don't know. I actually have a, a very bad hearing problem. Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't hear very well. So come on come on up here, come on up here so I can hear you. I think your question is how do we encourage diversity within the OpenStack community? Yes, diversity with uh, OpenStack communities. Oh, thank you. With uh, other communities, got it. Oh. With uh, the embedded embedded communities, device communities, device embedded. Embedded. device communities. Okay, there we go. How do you get embedded device guys and cloud guys to work together? Thank you. See, now we're all working together already. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so what do you guys think about that? We're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know there are, there, there are several um, committee like uh, one M2M, um, MQTT, or all thing, those are com uh, committees. I think those committees are open, and uh, um, I can say that for IBM in IoT, we participate in all those uh, committee as well. Um, that's intent is to have a good interaction between committees in device uh, manufacturer, um, silicon manufacturer, and the IoT service provider. So that, that's the intent, but I think that also um, take lots of effort from more company, big, small, medium, and the individual contributor and the open source committee to join to make sure we together build the best for our client, really, for ourselves. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. Uh, we talked about ethical responsibility. My question is on social responsibility. We are talking about an explosion in the number of devices that are going to spread over the world. We are talking in billions, and what I suspect might happen is we have these embedded devices distributed and forgotten over time until they actually become a problem and when we have to clean up our environment. So um, unlike the routers and the switchers and the storage devices we make that sit in a data center and that may have their own little recycling program that we can very closely control, these devices are going to come from a different paradigm. So I'm hoping that the companies uh, that you all represent have a program from day one that it's part of the organic design from the uh, start uh, understand this nature of these devices, that they are going to be out of control, forgotten. They are cheap devices, so no one is going to turn them in um, for any kind of a um, you know, trade-in. So they go out there and they are forgotten. So, But um, I hope they are responsibly, socially responsibly designed so they don't pose a problem to the planet down the lane. I hope so, too. I mean, we already see that kind of uh, issue, but it looks like Dickie's got a point. Yeah, I, and here, here's the flip side of that. I mean, obviously, I, I, it would be great for all companies to think green. Every time I see a styrofoam cup, I cringe, because <laughs> why is there styrofoam still? Uh, but, but thinking about devices, you know, some of the cooler technologies that I was checking out as I was researching for this panel are actually uh, around energy savings, uh, water savings, um, you know, things, even data centers, you know, farming, uh, there's the sensors now in smart cities that go on light, uh, light poles that can dynamically change lighting. If there's no cars, they actually shut off. And so I'm hoping that you know, social responsibility will come up front in the sense that hopefully we'll be saving a ton of resources. Uh, you know, even something like you know, using your Waze app, you know, trying to figure out where to navigate through traffic. I mean, if you think about how much, uh, how much fossil fuels are burned uh, getting from point A to point B, uh, my hope is that uh, you'll get a benefit from, from the Internet of Things devices sort of upfront, and hopefully that'll be followed up with some social responsibility in terms of recycling programs. I mean, I think we've been training people to recycle other things. I think at the point at which there's so many chips in everything, maybe we can train them to recycle that as well. Yes, sir. Uh, who's going to own all these devices? I mean, they're all software driven. And yeah, if That's the license actually expires or the company goes under. Do they just brick it? And and that just happened. That just happened with uh, was it the Nest thermostats that they decided that they're going to discontinue that and now Google has to pay like 
two hundred and thirty nine dollars to everybody who bought a Nest thermostat or something, <laughs> something like that. But but it's a good question. What do, what's your what's your opinions on that? Well, I think uh, to both of our contributors who just mentioned, it's sort of the two halves of the same problem. There's going to be a real concern about how quickly these devices, what their service lifetime is, what do you do when it has reached its end of life, either through the actions of the company, it, you know, it's just an outdated device. And then uh, to the contributors before, um, I don't think that we've wrapped our hands around the external costs uh, that these businesses, when they create devices, um, how do we handle all of the e-waste? Um, because the normal recycling programs, I don't think are really capable of handling some of these uh, electronics that are being put into the stream. I don't think that they they are. I agree with that. But in some respects, this is a different. This is this is an existing problem on a larger scale. Yeah. I mean, raise your hand if at any time in the last five years, or not even five years, in the last two years, you have bought Polaroid film. No, of course not. Nobody. You know, so what happens to your Polaroid camera? Can't even sell it on eBay. Nobody wants it. You know, so these are this is a problem that we already have in that we're a consumer society and we consume devices that rely on other things and now we're relying on things that we can't <laughs> can't hoard. But in a way it's good. I mean, if, if you are a a equipment manufacturer, you know, uh, if, if you're Nest, you know, you are gonna strive to create the best experience for your users as yeah. you can because if not, you're out a ton of money. And you're also probably gonna try to figure out some kind of subscription-based model so that you have a sustainable business. You know, if you have a dumb device, uh, dumb hardware, but you can keep updating it via software, that's great, right? Because then you could run that thing for a lot longer than you probably otherwise would have. But then you've, you've got a whole team of people that need to be you know, contributing software-wise and pushing all those updates out to all the devices that you have. So in a way, you know, it's, it's almost a survival of the fittest. You know? People are going to have to create really good technologies because if they don't, they're not going to get adopted. And I think the ones that are good, uh, that, that emerge out of startup land, are going to get acquired by the big companies. There you go, and, and and we'll get to your question in one second. But here's my question. At what point do you think we're gonna see generic devices that are all software defined? I think you just got yourself a company idea and hopefully you'll get acquired by one of those big companies that <laughs> Nikki. Hear that, Marantis? I got other options. All right. Sorry. That that's where open APIs though are, are really beneficial to a lot of people, right? You know, you think about like a Smart Things Hub or some of the other technologies. If this, then that. You know, these platforms that can talk to open APIs are huge. Uh, uh, Iron IO. We just uh, the OpenStack Unlock podcast will be featuring Iron Iron IO. See, I had to get a plug in there too. Thank you. Okay, I think we're I think we're about done. But let's uh, get your question. That was exactly what I was going to ask, is that OpenStack is built on open APIs, and they enable a service model economy uh, by non-OEMs. Uh, how is that going to apply in the embedded market? Well, that, there you go. So anybody want to give last words before we, we kick that out? I had Jim Curry, who uh, OpenStack was his idea. He won't take credit for it fully, but really smart guy. And he was talking about, about that very thing, about how OpenStack has actually kind of changed the way that especially enterprises look at open source software. And so my hope is that OpenStack and the success we've had as a community will be influential as people start thinking about creating these devices and making sure that they can be part of an integration engine uh, via APIs. Excellent. Any last words from anyone else? Uh, Go ahead. So uh, with all the risks and um, threats and security and data and all that, the projected uh, uh, market segment for IoT is in trillions, and it's going to explode more. So I think we should all adapt and find ways to um, rem uh, like uh, take care of the security issues and uh, you know this is a great opportunity rather than a threat that's what any other final words thank you all very very much